everybody. I want to start with a teeny little story that our Israeli panelists won't know. Uh, when I was a kid in California, there used to be a TV commercial, and it was for the hair club for men. And it started with a picture of a guy who was bald, and it went to a picture of a guy with full hair, the same man, and he said, I was a client, and now I'm president, and I can recommend the hair club for men. So you can look at me if you see me, I didn't succeed <laughs> at Hair Club for Men, but I did start as a client of the IRAC, of the Israel Religious Action Center. When my husband and I made Aliyah seven years ago, there were some hurdles we had to overcome as a gay reform rabbi and gay reform cantor, and the Israel Religious Action Center was there for us. And now I'm proud to be on the steering committee, supporting an organization that's so important to the values that we hold dear in Israel. So as I said, I'm Rabbi Don Gore. I made Aliyah seven years ago, having served as the senior rabbi at Temple Judean Tarzana for 26 years. Currently, I serve as the rabbinic liaison at Arts of World Da'at, the travel arm of the reform movement. We hope they'll be traveled to Israel again soon and proud to serve on the steering committee of the Israel Religious Action Center. Uh, we're glad you're with us today because it's pride around the world. And today's webinar is going to be a focus on the journey towards LGBTQ plus rights here in Israel. And it's important, this webinar, because it's Pride Month, which we can no longer celebrate in person with parades in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem. It's an important time in our history because we're facing in our world ways that we have to reimagine what human rights and human dignity mean, whether that's Black Lives Matter or what it means to survive during a pandemic. Uh, all of this reminds us that we need to see human rights as deeply interconnected. And preparing for today was evident to us at the Israel Religious Action Center that LGBTQ plus rights are part of the larger picture of human rights in a pluralistic democratic society such as Israel. And so today we're gonna to share with you a little bit about the journey towards LGBTQ plus rights and the struggle here in Israel and how the IRAC has been playing such an important role in fighting for these rights. We're gonna share the struggle along with the accomplishments of which we're really, really proud with two wonderful guests, but two notes as we start. Number one, we're appearing on Zoom and on Facebook Live and the sessions being recorded. Number two, if you have questions or comments, please utilize the chat or the comment function and we'll do our best to monitor them and get those questions to our two panelists who you're seeing on screen right now. So enough of introductions, let's jump into the uh, material, which is really, really rich with two heroes of human rights, my heroes, but heroes of human rights here in Israel. Two people who are going to share their stories with us, Rabbi Noah Satat and Ofer Erez, both of whom are on screen. I don't know which of you is going to go first, but I'm going to mute myself and let you guys jump in. Go ahead, Ofer. No, no, no. You are there. Oh. Uh, okay, so uh, good evening or good morning, everybody. Um, so, uh, Excited to be celebrating Pride in this uh, unusual but, uh, but wonderful way with all of you. Um, I uh, wanted to introduce myself and share a little bit of my personal story before we jump into the material. Um, so I'm uh, Rabbi Noah Satat, I'm the director of IRAC. Um, and my path to becoming a rabbi really went through my activism in the LGBT community. Um, and so Many, many years ago, I was the head of the Jerusalem Open House, um, which is the LGBT center here in Jerusalem. Um, and I think that certainly back then, and maybe until now, Jerusalem is the most religious city in the world that has an LGBT center in it, which provides many interesting challenges and opportunities. Um, and back then, I, it was the only LGBT organization in town. So I got to work with Palestinian lesbians and ultra-Orthodox gay men and every different sector of Jerusalem society that you can imagine. Um, and that um, brought me to an understanding of how 
religion in general and Ju Judaism in particular can be a destructive force ruining people's lives and how it can be a positive force for liberation, allowing people to be all that they can be. And that's one of the things that really inspired me to become a rabbi and to um, work for social justice from a Jewish perspective, because I think that that's such, such a needed thing in the reality of, uh, of Israeli society. Um, and so that, and, and when, uh, when we share the, the struggles of Iraq, the first one was when I was a client of Iraq, just like uh, Rabbi Don, um, and that was also a, a deep understanding for me of the role of Iraq in Israeli society. Hi, thank you, Noah. Uh, my name is Ophel. I was actually not so recent ago uh, the executive director of the Jewish Adam Open House, um, as Noah is not told about. Um, to the Jerusalem Open House, I came after six years in the military, where I um, started my uh, career as an activist. Um, I grew up in a kibbutz. Uh, uh, for who, uh, for those of you who never visit a kibbutz, it's a very small community in Israel. Uh, when I'm when I mean small, it's around 300 people, not even families. Um, I came out to my family and friends as a trans, uh, as a trans man when I was 16. Um, but in the kibbutz, we didn't have any sorts of LGBTQ community. Uh, the kibbutz is also a very secular place. Uh, and I uh, pretty much kept to myself. And I didn't see the connection between me and activism, uh, me or any other community beside my kibbutz. Um, during my military service, this whole thing uh, changed for me. Um, I started being involved in um, LGBTQ activism through um, individuals who came to me and asked for my advice and my help. And this is how I found my way to the LGBTQ uh, community and um, organizations uh, where I finally uh, decided to even leave the IDF for and started uh, working in the JOH. Um, but I think another um, a major change that happened to me during this time was I had the opportunity to go abroad, to go to the US and Canada to talk about my experience. And one of the most um, unique experiences I had was um, coming to, to the US and uh, being told that I need to speak in front of a synagogue and my heart dropped because in Israel, when they say synagogue, uh, we imagine a very ultra orthodox um, environment where I should be standing um, with the women uh, in the back. Uh, and I entered the synagogue and it was a huge LGBTQ uh, flag um, in the entrance and I was shocked. Uh, and then I was angry. I was angry that I needed to go um, to the other side of the world in order to feel welcome in a synagogue. Uh, and this experience um, was a part of the reason that I was happy to come to Jerusalem uh, and to Jer the Jerusalem open house and to the um, diversity and complexity Jerusalem bring with it. And, and that's also the reason that I find Iraq and the reform movement in Israel so important not just as a religious movement, but also as a, as a movement for social justice and, um, and a pluralistic society for all of us. And we will hear more about uh, this kind of, of pluralism and the way it affects um, Israeli society. Thank um, you, Ofer, and thank you, Noah. Did you want to add something, Noah? No. Okay, you will have lots of opportunity. Um, Thank you for sharing your stories with us because your shory, stories are illustrative of how important the IRAC is and the work that it does. Um, share with us, if you could, a little bit of the successes and the achievements of which the Israel Religious Action Center is really, really proud. And I think it's important as you tell the stories of these achievements that you add the context a little bit because I think for Americans, it's important that we understand the context of what it means to work with the Knesset and what it means to work within the courts, because those are both places where LGBTQ plus rights are, where the struggle takes place and the achievements have taken place as well. 
Thank you. So, um, so we're happy to, to talk a little bit about our work uh, for LGBT rights. Um, and I think that if we you know, generalize, um, the, the work in Israel is really divided or the LGBT life in Israel is really divided into um, multiple sectors, but we can generalize about three, which is one is the um, secular progressive Israel where LGBT rights have uh, shown huge improvement in the past uh, couple of decades. And it's a very progressive society, not perfect, but certainly um, at, at, a, at a certain level with other, <clears throat> with other uh, democracies. Uh, there's the conservative ultra-Orthodox community where, um, where it's a completely different experience. It's a completely different society. It's a completely, diff completely set, different set of opportunities for the LGBT ultra-Orthodox and, and, and conservative Orthodox communities and uh, the Palestinian LGBT community that is again separate and a completely different environment, a completely different reality. Um, and Jerusalem is one of the places where you can experience or you can see those differences. Um, and one of the first LGBT struggles that the Iraq took on was the um, struggle to have uh, Pride in Jerusalem. Uh, since uh, Pride in Jerusalem has been happening since 2002, uh, and very early on, both the municipality and the police attempted to block pride from happening, uh, both in terms of uh, denying permits or um, demanding payment for services uh, like security that would have canceled the march. Um, and IRAC represented um, the Jerusalem Open House in court again and again in an attempt to make sure that we, um, that we, ha that we are able to have pride in Jerusalem. Um, that we can uh, hang the pride flags in the streets of Jerusalem. It's been an ongoing struggle. Um, that's also, I think, the, f the first time that Iraq really engaged in LGBT uh, rights work because the um, uh, anti-pride arguments were so um, homophobic on the other one, but so on the other hand, but so um, um, deeply rooted in. Jewish language that Iraq felt um, we had to, to voice a different Jewish voice. Um, one of the, um, so these are different um, photos from, uh, from Jerusalem Pride. Uh, one of the other major achievements that we had uh, for the Jerusalem community, but it really had an impact on all of the LGBT communities in Israel, is that we got equal funding from the municipality for the Jerusalem Open House is an LGBT community center to be getting funding from the city like other uh, community centers. And that's really one of the things that allows for the operation of the Jerusalem Open House and of other uh, LGBT centers around Israel that they can have, they can apply for municipal funding and get um, um, municipal funding in, in the same way. Ofer, can you uh, share more about the struggle? Uh, I think what Noah described is, um, is a great example of our amazing legal work that is being supported by um, public work, uh, work with the, um, with the uh, LGBT community, with the reform community, with the general public in Israel, and of course with the um, uh, government offices. And I think one of the most interesting cases we had in the last few years is the adoption uh, issue for same-sex couples, uh, which are currently is not um, an option for, uh, for LGBTQ couples. It's been um, an ongoing uh, debate, which we, uh, the, the Iraq um, uh, filed a lawsuit in the Supreme Court here in Israel against the state saying this is uh, uh, discrimination. This is uh, basic discrimination. And um, the amazing thing was that uh, the reply of the state, the state of Israel, to the claims, um, um, to the lawsuit, to, um, was, uh, Noah, can you help me with the quote here? Um, that they don't want to burden the child uh, with uh, parents that are um, also, what? Um, They're unusual, abnormal. abnormal. 
there, there, would, uh, there would be an, uh, um, uh, an additional weight for the child to carry. Thank you. Um, and this was the official answer of the State of Israel why um, LGBTQ couples should not be able to adopt kids here. Uh, this was in 2017. What happened after uh, this answer was served to the court is Arak, of course, published this, uh, this answer and, and contact the LGBTQ um, um, major organization in Israel and the whole coalition. Uh, of LGBTQ organizations, and in a matter of days, um, a protest was organized um, outside of the, um, the government uh, headquarters in, in Tel Aviv. Um, I think it was around uh, 30,000 people uh, came to the protest, blocked one of the most um, main streets uh, of Tel Aviv, the, the main entrance, entrance towards Tel Aviv, with uh, one very clear demand, uh, stop the discrimination. And as you can understand, it wasn't just about adoption. It was, um, I don't want to call it an excuse, but it was an opportunity for the community to express their frustration um, around the discrimination we experienced here for many years regarding the law, because as, um, as uh, Rabbi David said, uh, sorry, uh, Burr said before, um, changes in the Israeli parliament, in, in the Knesset, is almost impossible in the last, in the least, in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and therefore, we are trying to build a different uh, strategy, either through the courts or through the public or through government um, offices. Uh, and here, the protest um, was so successful that I think it was a week or two weeks after it. This is um, a very short period of time that the ministry itself um, uh, sent um, um, a word to the press saying, I changed my mind. Uh, we will look into it and we will not um, allow discrimination. Um, the court uh, replied, not correct me if I'm wrong, the court also replied to the state, you should fix the law. Uh, the Supreme Court um, ordered the Knesset to uh, write and, and approve a law that is not discriminative uh, um, towards the LGBTQ community. And I think this is a case study for how you um, combine legal work with public work um, to affect the Knesset, even if it looks impossible, even if the Knesset is being governed by a very um, conservative and ultra-orthodox voices, you can navigate the, um, uh, the public um, voices in order to affect it in a very creative ways. Thank you. Um, so other um, cases that we wanted to, to uh, talk about are many of our uh, religious-based cases. So this is a photo of Nurit Melamed, who is a, an Israeli dance teacher uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem, and she's a lesbian. And she was teaching, and she teaches like in different in, um, neighborhoods in Jerusalem. She's a very famous and well-known teacher for those of us who understand dance. I do not. Um, and, um, and in one of the it's not an ultra-Orthodox neighborhood, but it's an Orthodox neighborhood in Jerusalem. Um, the rabbi of the neighborhood, who is a state employee, um, discovered that she was a lesbian and she wasn't in the closet or anything. And he published posters all over the neighborhood warning people uh, against going to her classes because she, as he said in those posters, is a danger to the public. Um, and he robbed her of her livelihood in those neighborhoods and that was a very important case for us, both in terms of protecting her and her rights, and also talking about the, um, the way uh, neighborhood rabbis conduct themselves uh, in, in Israel. And so we went to the district court and we, uh, we sued him and he won. And the first, uh, on the first uh, level he won, he said, I'm a rabbi. It's my job to warn the community of dangers I see this as a danger. It, it's my obligation. Not only is it my right to say that she's a danger to the public, this is my job. Uh, and we appealed. 
and we won on appeal uh, in, in a very uh, important case, both in terms of LGBT rights and the uh, anti-incitement precedent that we set, but also in terms of setting a limit to what rabbis can and cannot say about um, the LGBT community and other communities that they don't like. And, and uh, the fact that we were able to find the rabbi and restore her position is both a, a victory to LGBT rights uh, and a victory against religious coercion. Um, some other of, of our um, uh, work against uh, major rabbis in Israel is against rabbis who incite. Um, we've been working against uh, uh, incitement by rabbis for, um, for many years now. And one of our chief, uh, maybe our, our one chief nemesis is Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu. He is uh, the chief rabbi of Safed, of Tzfat, a city in the north of uh, Israel. He gets his salary. A chief rabbi in Israel is a civil servant. He is uh, in, ranked in civil, servant, in civil service in the same level of a judge. Uh, and his salary is about 700,000 uh, new Israeli shekels from the Israeli government. And he regularly incites against both Arabs and the LGBT community. Um, we brought several of the many, many quotes that we have um, uh, of him uh, uh, inciting against the LGBT community. Um, so here is, uh, he said that uh, we have to lo le'afsher le'medina liot lahatavistan. Let's not uh, let Israel become LGBTQ stan, uh, which is a nice way to think to see how he's both uh, homophobic and uh, Islamophobic in the one word. Um, and and another example of the quote is. Uh, there is a LGBT terrorism which coerces itself um, on the system against uh, healthy thinking. Um, and we are now on our third appeal to the Supreme Court uh, after a 12 year struggle to get, uh, to get him fired from his position. Through our appeals, we've managed to block his, um, his progress in the city rabbis. He wanted to be the um, chief Rabbi of Israel and the Chief Rabbi of Jerusalem, and through our work against him, we've been able to block him for progress, but we've not been able to get him fired yet. Um, and I'm hoping 2021 is the year where we, uh, when where we're going to be able to make it happen. And uh, and again, that will be a very um, important sign from for my, a very important victory for minorities that they're protected from. Uh, incitement and discrimination in the, in the civil service. Um, uh, we've been working for many years against a hate group called Lehava, uh, which is basically a Jewish supremacist work, uh, group that um, mostly targets Arabs uh, and uh, aims to terrorize and, and, and create fear against Arabs and um, act violently against them. Um, Here's uh, signs that they have against the Pride March in Jerusalem. And the sign here says, uh, don't give them children. And it's not pride, it's profanity. Um, and uh, this, uh, this month, uh, the head of the organization has been, uh, this, the head of the organization has been charged after many years of struggle from Iraq. And this month his trial began and we're hoping that through um, him being uh, brought to justice, we can curb the growth of the organization. Um, uh, another great success that we're very proud of is the um, uh, same-sex, uh, the Aliyah benefits for same-sex uh, partners. So if, if anybody is considering making Aliyah now, we're all for it. Uh, Vaidan can tell you all about it. It's a great idea. Uh, um, the, uh, anybody, any Jewish person or a person who's um, eligible by the law of return can make Aliyah to Israel and they get certain benefits uh, in making Aliyah. Um, their spo the spouse of a person who's entitled to make Aliyah also gets these benefits. 
Uh, but until 2014 and the work of IRAF, same-sex partners were not eligible for these benefits and, uh, and now uh, they are. And we continue to work with different uh, um, LGBT uh, olim to make sure that they have their rights actually. We have some exciting news that we can share now on the webinar, but we're hoping to share later during Pride about more benefits that we were able to secure for a same-sex uh, Olim. Very exciting, great. Um, I think these are the, the major successes that we've had so far. We're, thank you guys very much, it's inspirational. Um, we're getting a number of questions, should we hold them to the end? No, no, let's... Uh... Okay, so in no particular order, just as I've jotted them down, um, I know that the CCR just published a book called Mishkan Ga'ava, the, the book of pride, prayers for pride. I know that because I'm chair of the publication committee, so I helped bring that to be. Um, have you guys seen it? I know that I was going to pick mine up at CCR in Atlanta and wasn't able to uh, this year because I didn't go, because <laughs> it didn't take place. <laughs> have either of you seen it? Any comments? Uh, I, I, I saw the publicity about it. I'm so excited to see it, but I haven't seen it yet. So it's a hazard of the COVID world. We haven't been able to get yeah. our book yet. We look forward to. Absolutely. Um, quick question, interesting one. Does the rabbi who blocked the dance teacher have to pay any damages to her for lost salary and income? Uh, so she got compensation. Uh, we sued both him and the uh, uh, rabbinate of Jerusalem. And we're not sure who paid the fine. Um, but uh, but the, the woman was, was given... Uh, 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 serv severance, and I think that, that some of it was deducted from his salary, but we don't know. We don't know. We sued him personally, and we sued his employer. Okay, so there were damages. You just don't know who paid them. Yes. Got it. Um, you, you brought up LGBTQ workers' protection, and in light of the Supreme Court case in the U.S., which just extended that protection, what, what are the protections for the community here in Israel, employee protections? So we've, we've had non-discrimination in employment in Israel since 1992. Again, Israel is confusing. Uh, so in some places we are very advanced and way more advanced than in the US. Uh, so for instance, non-discrimination in the workplace has been around for a long time in Israel. Um, actually, uh, um, a couple of months ago, uh, we had our, um, uh, the same case uh, that was uh, tried in, this, in, the, in the U.S. Supreme Court last year about the um, wedding cake, I forget, the masterpiece, the bake shop or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that case was not yet won in the U.S. and it was won in Israel against a print shop that wouldn't print uh, pride flyers. Uh, so we also have that precedent working for us. So both in services and in employment, uh, there's no, there should be, it's illegal to discriminate. That's good to know. Example. Um, oh, Phil? I, I, another great example for a case we had just, uh, I think last year was uh, Sammy and the pizza. Um, <laughs> yeah. A precise example to the wedding cake, uh, which uh, um, a young student, he was, I think a student in, um, in the college, right? Yeah, in a first year rabbinic student at HUC came to participate in uh, the Jerusalem March for Pride and Tolerance and went after the Pride with uh, his Pride t-shirt to buy a pizza slice in the center of Jerusalem. And he was not only refused, but um, was harassed because of the shirt. The, the, the person in the shop the, tell, asked him about the shirt. He said, oh, so you are gay, get out of here. You're not getting, you cannot buy here. Um, and Semi came to the um, to Iraq, and I, it was super fast process. I think after a few months, you won the case. Um, I was back then in the Jerusalem open house, following the case and and um, and supporting Sammy. Um, and it was it was amazing to know that you know I was in the other side back then. It was amazing to know that. Um, our ability to support the community 
uh, if the Jerusalem Open House is, um, is a community center, we also have IRAC as a legal support and public support uh, for the community. Um, so I think, yeah, it was exactly the same case like the, uh, like the uh, wedding cake and it didn't need to go to the Supreme Court. It, it, I said, because the laws here were established many years ago, it, it ended in the, in the lowest kind of court, right? Yeah, a small claims court. Um, and uh, and Sami, uh, you know, not only uh, was he, um, you know, brave enough to bring the suit to us, he represented himself in small claims court. So you can imagine what that feels like when you're a first year rabbinic student. Uh, and he was just, and he, he and his classmates who were with him and, and experienced the discrimination were so great at explaining to the judge why this was wrong and why this was hurtful and why um, uh, we, we ha she had to put it right and, uh, and he did win um, uh, damages from the pizza place uh, and, and we are, uh, I, we think that that was a, a major deterrent against discrimination uh, in, uh, in services in Jerusalem for the LGBT community. And your smiles in the picture tell the whole story. Yeah. That's great. Um, one or two other questions and then we'll jump on to some other things we had prepared. Uh, someone asked about civil marriage for gay couples in Israel. I think that's an easy answer because there is no civil marriage in Israel. Uh, there's only marriage through the Orthodox Rabbanut. And anything you want to add? So marriage is a much broader issue in Israel than it is in the US because there is a huge Part of the population that can get married and, and that includes same-sex couples, people of different faiths um, who want to get married, um, uh, people who are not recognized as Jewish which are mostly uh, people from the former Soviet, former immigrants from the former Soviet Union, uh, and people who for instance are straight Jewish reformed Jews who want to have a reform wedding and not an orthodox wedding. Um, so there's a big population that cannot get married in Israel because we have no uh, civil marriage at all. Uh, and so, uh, for instance, when Don or I do a wedding in Israel with a chuppah and a ketubah and seven blessings and everything that you know about a Jewish marriage, that wedding does not, is not recognized in Israel. And then the couple that we marry uh, fly to Cyprus, which is the nearest destination that people can fly to. And we're the second largest industry is marrying Israeli couples and also Lebanese couples. They're also stuck in the same system. Uh, and then there, the Archbishop of Larnaca marries them under a big cross and that wedding is recognized in Israel. Um, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, and for same sex couples, uh, um, couples who do want to get married, they can get married in, uh, um, in countries that allow same-sex marriage, such as the U.S. and Canada and, um, and Spain. And those um, weddings are recognized in Israel, but obviously it's a very, it's a much more expensive and discriminatory process again, uh, versus um, uh, straight couples. And I want to add to this that after you get married, which is uh, a very nice and happy event where you and your partner coordinate the event, the problem is that getting divorced in Israel um, is also being controlled by uh, the Orthodox Rabbanut. No, here again, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but it was also a long legal process to be able to get divorced here, which is also a basic right. Um, so it was also complicated until um, some solution was built through the court, right? So. So actually, uh, same-sex couples are the only couples in Israel who can get divorced outside of the rabbinate, which, you know, I'm, I'm always hoping that our legal team will find some way to uh, help the poor straight couples who need to go through the rabbinate and they're discriminated against versus gay couples. Uh, um, because they, they really, because the rabbinate doesn't recognize same-sex marriage, uh, it does not do the divorce and it refers uh, couples to the civil court. Um, and that's a, that's a venue that's already been established, but it's only available to same-sex couples. 
Got it. We, we have an interesting question. There, there was a great event that the IRAC helped organize in New York and in Washington, D.C. about three weddings in a statement. Do you want to share with us a little bit about that event? Oh, that's a, that was fabulous. Um, um, so um, in order to raise awareness to the um, marriage issue in Israel, we brought, um, on two separate occasions, we brought three couples uh, who couldn't get married in Israel to New York City and to D.C. And we had major uh, weddings for them uh, where there, there are families that didn't attend, but the communities that, and the congregations that hosted them acted as their families as they had the Jewish wedding that they wanted to have but was not recognized in Israel. Um, so we had thousands of people uh, in New York City and in DC who came and participated in the Simcha and helped build these fantastic Jewish homes for uh, people who converted to Judaism through the, um, through the reform movement uh, and this so they're not recognized as Jews and for same-sex couples and for um, people who you know, are part of the reformed communities and they did not want uh, an orthodox marriage. Uh, and that was a very powerful way uh, for us to, sh to, li to link the communities. And it also got a lot of press coverage both in the US and in Israel, uh, keeping the issue alive in, um, in, in the media and in the political discourse. Um, the marriage system that Israel use, uses is a system that we inherited not from the British mandate, but from the Ottoman Empire. It's about 190 years old and it's been in Israel since its inception. Um, it's um, much easier to, to uh, achieve change uh, if you act quickly. Now when there's an issue, if we tackle it quickly, we have a much bigger chance of changing it than looking at systems that have been around for a long time. Um, which is why I think uh, the marriage issue is one of the last issues that we're going to win on in terms of religion and state, even though it's such an central issue that impacts all Israelis. Uh, and so we need to build our stamina for a long-term struggle on this and keeping it in awareness is a critical part of, of the long-term strategy for change. Thank you, Noah. Um, some questions about, are there cases dealing with transgender rights? that we're working on right now through the IRAC? And, and where are we in terms of working on surrogacy at the moment? Um, so in terms of um, transgender rights, it's mostly um, the work that, the ongoing work that we do is also uh, about the rights of Olim, uh, because uh, having the rights to make Aliyah is a lot about your birth certificate and your, um, um, all sorts of proof of your parent, uh, of your lineage. And so people who have one name and one, uh, and one sex in their birth certificate and then uh, have a different name and a different sex uh, when they come to apply for Aliyah have encountered many problems. And it's happened all over the world, you know, in the former Soviet Union, in Chile, in the US. Uh, and so we have uh, um, adopted a system that allows for, for transgender people to make Aliyah if, if they want. Uh, I do, I'm not aware of any um, ongoing uh, transgender cases for, for IRAC right now. And surrogacy? Um, so surrogacy is a major issue in Israel. And I, and I think that um, A, Israel is a, a society that's obsessed with babies, which is understandable. They're very cute. And also um, Israel, in many ways, saying that um, we as LGBT people are not fit to be parents is a way of robbing us of our humanity and of our dignity. It's a very profound thing to say about a person that they're not allowed to be parents and then they won't be good parents. I think that's one of the reasons why the adoption case um, raised such an uproar, even though many of the people who participated in the demonstrations were not considering adoption. They felt that saying that we could, we're not worthy of adoption um, is deeply hurtful. Um, so surrogacy, just like, uh, just like adoption, surrogacy was a case that was heard in the Supreme Court. Uh, it was led by uh, the um, <clears throat> LGBT Association of Israel. And, um, and it's currently, uh, the, the current status of it is that the state committed to changing the law in the same way that the state committed to changing the law on adoption. And we're waiting for that change 
Uh, but right now, uh, same-sex couples cannot have surrogacy in Israel. So they have surrogacy all, all over the world, but mostly in the US and Canada. Um, and actually, in a very moving way, I, uh, uh, our friends in the uh, Toronto Jewish community have helped us. Um, uh, I had a, a, an LGBT lawyer who reached out to me, telling me that she had a client who uh, is in Canada alone. He just had a daughter who is, you know, he's a first time father. He has a two day old daughter and she won't stop crying. And she, you know, she's a small baby and he's all alone. And he is in North Ontario, which is 20 hours drive from Toronto. And uh, he's all alone and he's gonna be there for months now because of the coronavirus, getting the different certificates that he needs to get her to Israel will take a long time. And our friends in the Toronto Jewish community in two days found like all sorts of uh, ministers and, uh, uh, and LGBT activists in that small town 20 hours north of Toronto to help him and give him support and, and visit with him and he's doing much better. So while we are still in the situation where uh, LGBT people have to go to, to the US and Canada for surrogacy, our communities in, in, in North America have really been uh, supportive of, uh, of Israeli couples and Israeli people coming to be parents in, in the U.S. And Great Canada. examples of partnership. Wonderful. Um, question about, is there any Orthodox support of the Israel Religious Action Center and its work, particularly in LGBTQ rights, but other work that we do as well? Are there Orthodox rabbis or any other support? That's a great question. We work with, with many uh, Orthodox um, clients and, and, and people, Milamed is from an Orthodox family. Um, and we work in partnership with many Orthodox organizations on, uh, on all of our issues. Um, I think that the Orthodox, the liberal Orthodox community has gone through a sea change in the past 10 years in terms of um, the relationship with the LGBT community. And I think that that's one of the reasons why we can work in partnership with very strong Orthodox organizations that support LGBT rights. They don't have to have IRAC. They have uh, within the Orthodox community um, a growing uh, network of support for LGBT rights as well. And we can collaborate with them. And I'll just add on a one-to-one, -one, many people in our building are Orthodox ranging on up to ultra-Orthodox and very welcoming of me and Evan. We've had Shabbat together. So on a one-to-one -one basis, they may not be supportive publicly, but there is support individually, and that's nice to see also. Um, earlier on, Ofer, you mentioned the struggle of working with the Knesset that hasn't been overly supportive of pluralistic rights, of the rights of democracy as we see them, and the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, we have a new Knesset after three elections, um, maybe a mishmash of a Knesset, but Tell us a little bit about what it's like at the moment, uh, what your challenges and vision are working with this new Knesset. Wow, uh, it's a big question. Um, I will try to make it as clear as possible, but stop me if, if, I'm, um, if I'm making too much of a mess. Um, in the last 10 years, we saw a Knesset being um, fully dominated by the right wing slash um, conservative wing. Uh, the Israeli Knesset, not like um, other parliaments, is um, uh, determined by a coalition. It's not uh, who is the biggest party, but who can create a coalition of the, um, of the majority. And therefore, you have um, cases where even if the biggest party supports something, a small party can drag everyone um, to their direction in order to keep the coalition intact. So what we saw in the last 10 years is, again, a very conservative um, Knesset. Um, and now after three elections, yes, you can laugh at us, after three elections, um, the two biggest parties, uh, biggest party the right, uh, from the right side, uh, the Likud, and from the center, or some say center left, um, uh, Kahol Avan decided to create a coalition together and they gather some small parties with them, some from the left, like the Avoda, and some from the right, uh, and the ultra orthodox. Uh, and therefore, they form uh, a government where we have more um, 
partners than we had for the last 10 years. We have, um, uh, for example, the Minister of, um, of Welfare um, is a gay man uh, from the Avoda party, which is uh, um, considered to be left uh, and liberal. Um, we have uh, a lot of ministers, new ministers from the Kahol Avan um, party, which again, their, at least their uh, promises during the elections were very liberal and very pro-LGBTQ and um, anti-racism um, and all the, all the right things, let's call it. Uh, and now the challenges actually make things happen. And as we said before, passing a law in the Knesset is different than uh, promoting a policy uh, or promoting some change in some policy or some law. Um, so we actually, in the last few months, uh, planned, uh, planned and um, pre prepare ourselves to each scenario and we mapped all the different um, uh, government offices and govern, uh, government um, ministries and what we can promote, what we can do in those offices um, uh, after taking into consideration the political status because we unfortunately does not work uh, we do not work in, um, in, a, in, a, in a vacuum. Uh, we need to take into consideration the political situation. And so we not only map everything, but also, um, I don't want to call it rank, but we decided where we should uh, put our efforts. Uh, for example, in the, uh, as, as, I, as I said, we have the uh, Minister of, of Welfare, which we know is supposed to be very friendly and very supportive of our causes. Uh, the same, but this is only the coalition. We are very good uh, in working with, also with the coalition, uh, well, I'm sorry, with the opposition uh, and uh, working with um, the different kind of committees that are supposed to uh, oversee the work of the government. Uh, and we try to, um, again, to, to uh, work with any kind of party and politician and um, a minister, we can, we does not discriminate, discriminate uh, against anyone. If someone can have um, uh, the same interest as ours, we will work with them. Uh, and this is where it gets complicated. You need to convince them we have the same, uh, the same goals. Um, and again, to find a way to work sometimes um, to uh, put things in the media in order to push some sort of, uh, of progress or the other way around, do things very, very quietly and sometimes through other people because we know the media and the public attention will just hurt the process. So we need to be very gentle and very um, smart about it. Thank you, Ofer. Noah, do you want to add anything about the Knesset? Um, so I think that one of the, the ways when, why uh, 2019 was different um, than other years for us is that both um, LGBT rights and uh, progressive Jewish rights in Israel have not been a central issue in any um, government, any, in any parliamentary elections in Israel. Right? And I know that the same-sex uh, marriage issue was very central in, in election campaigns in the US. In Israel, it's always been a secondary issue that was barely even talked about. Uh, and in 2019, we saw a rise of a new organization and a new uh, party that centered around, began to be centered around um, uh, uh, LGBT rights. So this sign says, Abba, the Ima, Sheve Mishpacha, mother and father, that was, that's what equals family. And the uh, slogan, and that was the slogan of the party later, the courage to be normal. Here is a, and this is a huge billboard. It's one of the most expensive billboards uh, in Jerusalem. Um, and we saw more and more of these uh, in 2018 and 2019. In 2019, we saw, hold on. We saw that the same movement was also doing um, uh, other billboards. This is a billboard in Ramat Gan. It says the grandfather is reform saba reformi, which means the which means the father is assimilated, and the grandson a nechad is goy. Uh, the grandson is a goy, and we want to keep the kotel normal. 
Uh, and so we had this party, uh, which completely centered around, um, around a campaign against the, um, uh, the reform movement and the LGBT community. Uh, so you see these, these are the most expensive billboards in Israel. Uh, they're on Ayalon in Tel Aviv. Um, and the party was called Noam. Uh, and the slogan is, Israel chooses to be normal, Israel bocheret liot normalit. And you see that they have um, these kind of, they, in Israel we, we vote with, uh, with ballots. So they have like something on the ballot that's like a, a wish. And uh, this one says, I'm voting so that my son will marry a woman. And here it says, Israel chooses to be normal. And because I want, because I want my grandson to be Jewish, which is anti-reform rhetoric. Um, and uh, this is very interesting. We, um, the, the campaign was heavily funded. I mean, both in terms of the billboards that they could buy and in terms of the uh, um, uh, new media content that they produced. I wish any of the progressive uh, parties had the elaborate and sophisticated uh, new media mechanisms that the Noam party had. Um, and, it, and it's a mystery because we don't know who they are, we don't know who funds them, and we don't know who stands behind them. But there's a new uh, force in the Israeli political system. Uh, Noam didn't run in the 2020 elections, they only ran in the, the 2019 elections. They got very little votes, uh, but certainly they have very powerful backers. Uh, and one of our tasks going forward is to figure out who they are and how they are financed to look at. Um, uh, these, uh, this new organization that, that is targeting us. And it's a great opportunity for us to collaborate even more closely with the LGBT community uh, as uh, both the reform movement and the LGBT community seem to be the targets of, uh, of, this, uh, of this new party. Horrible equal opportunity discrimination. <laughs> exactly. Um, so Noah, you, you started to mention looking forward one of the challenges is working to learn more about this party and stop their work. What, I'm curious what you and Ofer see. We're hitting towards the end of our hour um, and, and you've shared wonderful things that we've done, really, really impressive things that the Israel Religious Action Center has achieved. What challenges do you see in the immediate future? What are, what are the agenda items coming in the next, in the short term? Ofer, you go ahead and I'll conclude. Oh, okay. Um, so first of all, I will start with something we haven't talked about yet, which is the LGBTQ activism inside the reform movement in Israel, uh, which is one of our main goals for the next few years. We started this Pride Month, actually we started much before, um, uh, way before that. Um, um, reform uh, communities in Israel are celebrating Pride and supporting local communities and, and the struggle as a whole, and we want to not only um, uh, those local communities, but also uh, provide them with tools and connection to social uh, justice and social struggles. Uh, so this is looking inside, looking outside of the reform movement. Um, we, as, as we mentioned before, the adoption um, issue is not solved yet. Uh, and beside that, um, so we, we need to keep monitoring the uh, work of the Knesset and the work of the government to make sure the laws that need to be, that would order to be changed are actually um, happening. Uh, beside it, I think if it, um, so this is one major, uh, major uh, challenge. I think for us, in, at least in the, in the public um, department, we need to keep monitoring uh, the work of uh, the Knesset to make sure no uh, problematic um, uh, laws being tried uh, uh, to pass because the ultra-orthodox and the um, ultra-conservative parties are still there. Um, beside that, we are continue supporting the Jerusalem Open House in Jerusalem and um, individuals regarding uh, cases. Um, no, what, what am I missing? I think you're not missing anything. I think that um, in general, these are, these are the major challenges. Um, we are 
concerned that this government may not um, uh, last long. And so we are very hard at work not to miss the opportunity that we currently have with progressive LGBT ministers in such powerful positions. Uh, so that even if the government falls in a year or even a shorter period of time that we have those achievements uh, locked. I think that in general, my, in my view, the, the, the major challenge is, that we have is to replicate the success that we've had in the LGBT struggle and looking at our other, other struggles, um, both in terms of um, uh, women's rights and in terms of uh, um, other minority rights in, in Israel, specifically Arabs and Palestinians, feel that the LGBT struggle is such a um, shining example of a successful liberal struggle in Israel, um, but it's unfortunately unique in the last 10 years in the meteoric success um, and so we need to, to, fig to learn from this success and see how we can replicate it in other areas. There's a lot of work to be done <laughs> and, and some good, good people doing the work. Um, anything else before we conclude? We're coming to conclusion. Anything else? Any last words, Ofer or Noah? I want to I wanna maybe finish with, uh, with an optimistic note, uh, something I always brag about, because as Noah and I told you, uh, Noah was the head of the Jerusalem Open House 15 years ago, right? Even more than that. And I finished my uh, term over there uh, six months ago. And one of the stories I always tell people is Noah and I met way before I joined the um, IRAC, uh, and we talked a lot about the Jerusalem Open House. She was and is still my mentor. Um, and one of the things that um, I told her about is that we are getting more funding from the municipality for uh, a staff member uh, to work with, uh, with youth. And she said, wow, is it new? And I said, oh no, it's, it's, um, we already have one staff member paid by the municipality. Now we're going to get another one. And she said, it sounds like the... Wow, I have no idea. Don, how do we say that? Uh, a vision for the future world. Yeah. Uh, the world would end when, and after yeah. the, the, the Jerusalem municipality will give a staff member to the Jerusalem open house to, to work with, the, uh, with our youth. And for me, it was the reality. And for Noah, I think it was something that they couldn't even dream of. And I think I, I mentioned this story because, yes, we have a long way to go. We have a lot of, of, of struggles ahead of us. Uh, and yet I think this example um, is, is, a, is, a, is a great way to see how the struggle um, is progressing and the small the things that look small to us create a very big ripples uh, over the years. And, and for the LGBTQ community now in Jerusalem, uh, the Pride March uh, is, is, a, is a given. Um, it's not something that the people even uh, afraid will be taking from them. Uh, and the fight now about the, the funding is uh, how much will we get and know if we will get it. Uh, so it's one step at a time. And um, this, is, this is my way to stay optimistic. <laughs> Thank you, Ofra. Noah. I think I just wanted to, to thank everybody who came to, to participate. It's uh, through this shared community that we get um, inspired and supported and specifically in, in difficult times like this, it's so important for us to be together and learn from each other and, and strengthen each other as we continue to move forward in, in, uh, in this struggle. Thank you. And thank you, Don, for, um, for leading us in this, uh, in this panel and, and, uh, and making it all come together. It's, it's really my pleasure. Look, that having the two of you is doing heroic things is really inspirational to all of us. And even though you both admitted there are great challenges ahead, I think because it's Pride Month, we should stop and pause and, and really take pride in the yeah. achievements of the Israel Religious Action Center so far. Uh, I'm proud to be on the steering committee. I'm proud of the work that the IREC does. All of us can support really what I think is Zionism today, creating a democratic, pluralistic Israel by supporting the Iraq. And, and I think it's something all of us, wherever we are in the world, uh, can help to do. So I think we're building a better Israel. Thanks to Ofer, thanks to Noah, thanks to all of our work. And thanks to all of you for joining us and supporting the Iraq and the important work. Thank you.
And if there no. are any other questions, feel free to email us and we will answer them. Specifically, people thinking about Aliyah. Let us know. We can, we're happy to, to help think about it with you. And all of that information is available on the website, the IRAC website. So uh, 